Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Making Dad Summit and we're on day three and we're so honored to have Dr. Turek with us today and of course my co-host Sarah Nab is with me. Um, but before we begin our Wednesday, I just want to take a moment and say it is with thanks that we acknowledge Fairbank, Fairfax Cryobank for sponsoring uh, the Making Dads Telesummit. It's through their generosity that this important conversation is funded. Fairfax Cryobank is one of the world's largest sperm bank offering anonymous and ID option sperm donations as well as storage service for sperm, embryo, and aocytes. You can find out more about uh, Fairfax Cryobank by visiting their website at fairfaxcryobank.com. So welcome Dr. Turek and Sarah, I know that you have a brief intro for uh, Dr. Turek, so thank you so much for, for being with us today. Sure. Thanks Kirsten, <laughs> thanks Sarah. Thank you. So uh, today we're going to be talking about advanced paternal age um, and I am so honored and excited to introduce Dr. Turek, who's really a man who needs no introduction. He's an incredible thought leader in this space and has done um, so much for advancing uh, awareness of male fertility issues and the treatment of men um, dealing with fertility. So uh, uh, just a, a really wonderful um, guest to have us join us. A little bit of background about Dr. Turek, uh, he, he's currently the director of the Turek Clinic, which is this fabulous um, uh, uh, clinic for men in uh, Beverly Hills and in San Francisco, California. Um, he has authored over 175 publications in this space. I mean, really, the man is a brain. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> Not just I mean, a pretty face, huh? No, not <laughs> average. You got the brain for us too. <laughs> I know. It's, he's he's just he's incredible, and and he's doing actively in a, in addition to everything else that he does, he's actively doing um, cutting edge leading research, um, which I'm always so excited to hear updates on. Um, he's working on developing uh, an artificial testicle um, to be able to make sperm in a dish, which is just the the most amazing hope for men who suffer from azoospermia and he's uh, recently re received a, a NIH grant to do so. So, um, you know, I could go on and probably talk for the entire time about how great Dr. Turek is, but I think we should move into... No, because um, the crowd is going wild. <laughs> Yay, um, Dr. Turek! Woo! I'm do my worst. <laughs> so welcome, so, we're, we're excited that you're here. I don't know who you're talking about, but they're all... <laughs> We're talking about you. So, so you, I, I'm so excited. So why don't we just let you take the lead on advanced paternal age because I'm excited to be educated during our time together. So, Well, I think we could start, this could go on a long time, but I would say that men want to know what happens to their sperm as they age because it's pretty clear that things happen to women's eggs as they age and one of the concerns is you know their fertility how does that change with age mm -hmm. or their semen analysis because women lose their fertility with age and how do men lose their fertility with age and then the other issue is as women age there are higher rates of issues with the kids like chromosomal abnormalities right. and the question is so what's true of men is that true of men so I would take it as what's going on with my fertility as I age and what's going on with the health of my children as I age okay learning one is the health of children so fertility wise uh, men are good forever uh, you know they they don't have the same cliff that women have with paternal age as women have with maternal age. So typically the numbers are that the count doesn't really fall until men are in their eighth decade. The sperm counts remain high. The motility is the movement of sperm on the semen analysis will change by about a percent per year lowering after age 30 or 40. So 
50% is normal, 49%, 48%. So you do see a decline in motility. And fertility is not the same as that. Fertility changes too, but more dramatically, but it's more complicated because it may not just simply be due to the semen analysis changing. It may be due to their age and other issues. Other wrenches thrown in this include um, erectile dysfunction, uh, sex drive, frequency of ejaculation, all those um, sort of epidemiologic trends have play in on fertility and the partners, etc. So if you control for lots of those, you still see a decline in fertility, but it's not like female. So that's all I really want to say about the semen analysis. Okay. More concerning is what happens to men's sperm with age, and they do collect abnormalities because the machinery is getting older, and what changes in the machinery of the testicle when it makes sperm is quality control. So you want the product to be good, mm -hmm. uh, like the Ford Model T on the assembly line, there's quality control, so each of them turns out well. Well, that quality control goes a little bit downhill uh, because of just usage. And it's kind of, it can, you can sort of explain it as an engine that's getting older and wears out a little bit and doesn't run as smoothly. So the sperm look fine, but their genetic package is a little altered. And uh, women have that too, but it's a different problem and a different result. What they get is their eggs are sort of as old as they are, and the eggs kind of get dings in them, and they get chromosomal issues. Men don't get chromosomal issues as much. They get issues with DNA fragmentation, and they get issues with single gene mutation. So what happens is the system doesn't let, the system doesn't screen out the small errors that are being made routinely and fix them anymore as well. So they sneak through the system through the quality control. Maybe quality control goes to sleep or something. But something happens where they get through. And those things that get through can be very meaningful to children, to offspring, because they are known to cause rare diseases like hemophilia and retinoblastoma and some of them, a lot of them very debilitating diseases in kids. So there's a different mechanism as women and a different problem and you can't screen for it like you can with women with amniocentesis and things like that. So that's the real concern. And some of the other ones that are coming up on the radar for in the offspring of older men are autism schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and dyslexia, and things like that. And those are adult diseases in offspring. So you won't see those for 20 to 30 years. So that's a real concern. And a lot of these conditions have other issues. There are other concerns about why they're happening, urban environments, vaccines for autism, et cetera. But, um, but this is a definite contributor to that. So I don't want to scare you. but the rates we're talking about are sort of 1% issues, so let's go general. In general, birth defects occur in about 3 to 3.5% 3 of kids in normally fertile couples. Okay, So this is not a fertility issue. This is really a, a, a birth defect issue, et cetera, or an um, offspring health issue. And so 3 to 3.5% 3 of offspring have some issues in, in normal couples, normally fertile couples. And so we're looking at a 1% to 1.5% chance of this being an issue in younger men to maybe 3 to 4% in older men. And so what do you mean by older, younger? So we're looking at sort of 20 to 30-year-old fathers versus 60 to 70-year-old fathers. So, and we don't know the relationship with age, whether it's linear or how it changes we do with women. And what's really interesting is a nice paper came out showing that even teenage fathers will introduce these issues to their kids. So the quality control isn't perfect to begin with and gets a little worse with age. It's not like it works perfectly to start with and gets worse with age. It's never been, it's never perfect. And some might call that evolution. Um, so, and that may be part of what God or Darwin has in store for us, but it is an issue. And we just don't see 
uh, we see a lot more older fathers now. That's what's going on. The average age of fatherhood in the U.S. is up, and in developed countries it goes up. And you know, there's a lot less fertility too because it's willful. It's voluntarily. There's a lot fewer kids being made in in developing countries. And when they do decide, they decide a little later. So it's maybe ten years older than it was two generations ago of fatherhood. So that's the big issue. So I have a question about this in my my little way of processing this. So uh, I can see the smoke what, coming out of you know. there is. Can you see? I was scribbling notes frantically while you were talking. Um, so you talked about the DNA fragmenting, and if I if you're going through fertility, is this fragmenting able to be seen in like the sperm wash, or is it not detectable? I missed that part because I was taking notes. So is this fragmenting detectable or not detectable? I missed that part because we didn't talk much about it. Oh, see, I thought that was my brain going, i got to ask that question, you so, know, I'm that girl in class, you know. Fragmentation rate is a different issue, and it comes about the, the, the quality of the packaging of the sperm, in, of, the, of the DNA in the sperm, and that is a something that has to be done like packing vases for shipping that has to be done right or things break. And so what happens is DNA in the sperm is transported to the egg. The egg looks at it, invites it in, there's fertilization. Technically that's pregnancy. And then there's a dance. And on that dance the egg says to the sperm, you know, let's dance and show me your stuff and undress. And then the DNA gets exposed to the egg and the egg has to make a decision. Is this DNA okay, is, it, is this package, is this payload worth working with or not? And it turns on early on during after fertilization, it turns on 3,500 DNA mismatch repair genes to fix what it doesn't like. And the, remember, the male genome is responsible for evolution. Right. Its job is to bring in errors and changes and mutations and let the egg decide. The, eggs, the quality control issue is egg-related. So, so the girl really still not back her guys all the time. So, so she really do have the power from the beginning. <laughs> so if you introduce too many errors in your DNA and you, it's too fragmented, the egg will look at that sperm and say, you know, nice try. This dance is not going to happen. See you later next month. And things are turned off. So the fragmentation so rate typically causes, as it goes up, problems with fertility and problems with miscarriage. It doesn't typically, it's not known to cause problems with birth defects okay. or with an offspring, but we don't know for sure. And the big variable in all this, we talked about DNA fragmentation, we talked about gene mutations, there's also epigenetic changes in sperm which might be as powerful as gene mutations and might be related to them. And there's good evidence now that epigenetic changes which could occur with lifestyle issues as well as age, and certainly age, might cause problems that lead to autism in kids. So it's another level of control that's losing control. So do you see increased DNA fragmentation in older men, or is that something that's across the board also? It's pretty much linear with age. So think about 10% per decade. So normal would be less than 15% fragmentation. It's about Andy Wyrobic at Lawrence Livermore Labs did a nice study with paternal age, and it went up about 10% per decade of life. So in cases, so, so you're saying fragmentation can, can uh, influence miscarriage. So if you're an older uh, gentleman and you're having problems with recurring miscarriages, it might be useful to get a DNA fragmentation screen to see if that's a contributing factor. Absolutely, it's one of the. It's not a standard practice, but it's it's something you could look at along with karyotype, just to just look at the things that happen in younger fathers with recurrent miscarriages, but with older fathers that would probably be more likely. So, um, you know, for older guys who are trying to, you know, be responsible. I mean, a lot of the reasons that men delay fatherhood is that they're trying to get their financial house in order and be more uh, responsible. Um, are there things that they can do in their lifestyle, in their health, in the way that they treat their body to improve 
the the way that they are making sperm, the quality control systems, the fragmentation rates, all those kinds of things. Are, are there things that it can do, or is this just a this is part of aging and that's it? I think part of it's part of aging, and part of it is what you do. So think of the testicle and sperm production as an engine, maybe an Italian one, running at very high RPM. So it's running really hard, really fast. And so in terms of fertility, it's the same advice to young men, which is you got to, what you can do is reduce its ability to run hard by putting, you know, water instead of oil or gas in there or smoking or or being overweight or taking hot tubs or doing things. So I think that you can hurt things a lot, but if you left it alone and took perfect care of it, it would run as hard as it can. So you can have an effect on it with age, and age does have its own independent effects. On it. I was going to ask them to stop that, but you guys can keep going. And edit. Lawn outside, and she's they. You know, there was another study in which, um, I think it was antiaerobic too, did this study where they supplemented men with high fragmentation rates with age-related fragmentation rate issues with antioxidant supplements, and they got benefit. So their fragmentation rates went down. So what I would say is healthy lifestyle, good, good overall health, consider an antioxidant supplement, um, and, you know, because I, I believe that men should be on prenatals just like women. Yeah, I think that's a that's a, a phenomenally powerful uh, statement and and very tweetable that that the testicle is really like a Ferrari and you need to put the best uh, coolant and oil and and things in it and treat that car right so you can you can have that uh, that engine running at full capacity and uh, people and, ask me all and treating, say what people ask me all the time how do I improve my sperm count. And the answer is, it wants to run hard. It wants to run hard. So you actually can't, if you're normal, you can improve it because it's running at full RPM, full tilt, top speed. What you can do is take good care of yourself so you don't impair its ability to run hard. That's a beautiful, great statement. Thank you for that. I think I um, tell Dr. Turk the story, and, and I was thinking about this conversation. Uh, I went grocery shopping, and the, the younger kid behind the deli counter, uh, the other woman and I were talking about our children, and he piped in, and he said, well, I can't talk about my kids because I'm not having, I don't have them yet. They're not here. And I'm like, oh, really? And he's like, yeah, I'm going to wait until I'm 50 and then marry a young chick around 30, and then I don't have to worry about it. She'll have to worry about it. And literally, you know how you said you saw smoke out of my ears? I was like, really? And I said, do you realize that male, you know, male fertility affects 40% of fertility diagnosis? And the kid's just cutting ham, you know? He's just minding his own business, <laughs> slicing the deli meat. And I'm like, and he looked up and he goes, no, no, you didn't hear me. I'm just going to marry a younger woman. Like, like, and I'm like, I know you don't know me, but you need to get educated because that's not how this is going to roll, honey. Just like that. And, and the poor kid, <laughs> it was like all the people around the deli pit counter were just looking at me like, who is this woman? You know, like, what is her, what is her beef, you know? But it's so amazing that it's not in people's awareness of oh. what you just eloquently said that um, the mechanics of it, you know, and, and, and the effects of your body as a machine. So I was waiting to tell you that because, and, and he, was a, he wasn't a younger, you know, he was probably close to 30. So you would think that that was already in the ether for them, but it's not. I think what's in the ether is the fact that women lose their fertility with age, and that's sinking into men, and that's why he said that. And he's of the impression that there's no issues with men. Right. With the thinking until the last five years for the last 500. Or maybe a thousand. Well, I don't know if cavemen thought about it much, but <laughs> well, that's why I, I, I was so excited about this, you know, this topic because it really, truly isn't in the mainstream or an awareness because of what you said at the beginning. Men, you know, into their, you know, sixties, but it doesn't talk about the mechanics of it. You know, like you're. Yeah, you're sure your body's doing what it should be, but is it doing it like you say? You know, it's running hard at high speeds. <laughs> the, so, other, 
there was a very interesting study published in the New England Journal of Medicine two weeks ago by a colleague named Alice Lechenko from Pittsburgh that found that the what, the mom's X chromosome holds genes on it that can affect the son's fertility. So there are male fertility genes on the X chromosome, which we have been suspicious about for about 10 years since it showed up in mice. But he actually found a gene on the X chromosome, and he calculates that the woman got, so the woman doesn't need the male fertility gene on the X chromosome, so it doesn't affect her health or her fertility, but she hands off an X chromosome to her son, and that kicks in. So there clearly are some important male fertility genes on the X chromosome, which is kind of against our culture to think about it like that. He suspects in a press release that it's the grandfather's age that introduced the mutation to the gene on the, his X chromosome who handed it off to his daughter who carried it another generation and then it off to a son, so a grandson who had the fertility problem. So transgenerational genetics is also new and probably powerful. So the great-grandfather of the son. Great, the grandfather of the son. The grandfather of the son. Okay. So okay. his age may have led to fertility in the grandson. That's amazing. That's amazing. And then in epigenetic, the world of epigenetics, which I'm not going to explain because it's too complicated, but it's not gene mutations in the DNA code. It's the way they're expressed and held back and put forth not every gene gets expressed. It's really why we're all different, although our DNA is basically identical. But that regulation is probably lifestyle mediated, and that is the one way that you could, by doing things wrong in this life, affect the health of your, the, the reproductive health of your son or daughter. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So when you talk about the ripple effect of your choices within your lifestyle, and um, you know, becoming conscious of your, your your choices because you're not affecting just your body or your children's body. It's the legacy of your grandchildren. You know, do, do you think this grandfather? You think my grandfather thinking, hmm, if my granddaughter ever had a son, I might be affecting you know uh, that that child's life. You know, you think oh. of it. I don't like to alarm people, but we are, we are, I'm part of a company called Epistona, and we're working on a genetic, an epigenetic screen for, for men, um, which is very promising, and that will sort of help us solve, get answers. For instance, if you can mess it up, can you correct it, right? So if right. you do things to mess it up, are there ways to correct it? And we don't know, but it does play in, again, to the antioxidant vitamin issue of the prenatal for men. Women have had it for 50 years. Maybe it's affecting other things besides fragmentation. Maybe it's affecting, you know, other types of health. Maybe, maybe your overall health is exquisitely uh, linked to your reproductive health. We always thought it mattered, you know, if you're overweight or not. But maybe the details, maybe the devil's in the details. Well, Dr. Turek, we received a. Um, maybe I can just ask you this because one of the uh, people who um, registered. And it was speaking just to that. Are there any neutral steps to take through diet or supplements to overcome anti-sperm antibodies? Um, and just the way that you said that is, it, 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 of course, your nutritional intake affects everything in your body. But they asked specifically about supplements. But I was talking more about diet. So there's. Yeah, so that they talked about antibodies, which is a separate topic. It's not genetic. Antibodies are a, are are being vaccinated against your sperm. It occurs in three percent of fertile men, ten percent of infertile men, and it's where you're kind of inoculated against your sperm, and you throw proteins on them like you're trying to kill them. And if you don't kill them, the woman sees the sperm with a with an antibody. It's like a red flag, and it kills it. So you don't it, it impairs fertility, and so no, I'm, I'm pretty much trained as an immunologist in my research and, and there's nothing you can take uh, besides heavy duty uh, steroidal anti-inflammatories that we give to kidney transplant patients and liver transplant patients to try to knock the immune system down in a bludgeon effect and keep the antibodies down to improve fertility which has a lot of side effects and it hasn't been shown to work that well. So, so, so we don't, 
once you have an antibody, you, your immune system has a perfect memory. You pretty much will always have antibodies. The level matters because you can still be fertile with low levels, but that's probably not amendable to supplements or diet. Okay, thank you so much. But that I, if we went back to what you were talking about before about the nutritional uh, aspects of lifestyle, and you know that correlation, it's it almost it almost feels like you're bringing the consciousness to a deeper level because it feels like we talk about lifestyle and dietary changes and uh, alcohol not only to create a healthy baby but also to create a healthy being but you're you're bringing it to such a deeper level that you know conscious choice affects the ripple of of you know evolution which is you know uh, something that we need to be screaming about <laughs> Yes, and I, I mean, I don't want to alarm people. I, I think that we do a good job. I, I you know, I, I think that what what impresses me is how related sexual health is to overall health. And I think that what that's that's a good message for men. If you want to be fertile, you got to take great care of yourself. And my term is treat your body like a temple. You know, you really have to preserve and take great care for lots of reasons. So. When I have a smoker come in and I show him his fragmentation rate is high because he's smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, and that's a number. He responds to the number, so he cuts down. He takes an antioxidant and cuts down on his smoking. And then I think, well, that's great for the fertility, but you know what? I just added five years to his life. Right. That's what, you know, so that's being a doctor. Right, right. That's that's uh, it's powerful, and I'm not I'm not speaking about that in a, an alarmist way. I'm just speaking about connecting the dots to the wholeness of who we are, how connected we are. You know how how today you know there's a ripple that we're not even seeing into the future about the choices that you make, and that's what you're you know when you say overall health, it's an overall health health of the well-being of everybody <laughs> just by making simple little choices that uh, is is powerful yeah and I you know I just want to put one more thing in perspective that the rates of these issues in children from male issue from male factor related to men's age are really one-tenth as common as rates of issues with women issues with children related to women's age so they're similar curves, but they're very different heights. Though so the frequency of problems that kids get are usually much more commonly from the mom than from the dad. Right. But the kinds of things they collect, the kids collect, are very different from mom and from dad. So, for instance, you know, age, paternal age-related autism will not account for all autism. It's probably going to be one fifth of it. But, but it. So it's not the whole story, and so that's so I'm just putting in perspective. You'd still worry more about the contributions of chromosomal issues to kids than you would from things that older dads contribute. And you know, the oldest dad I think now is 96. He had his first, he had one kid at 94, and another one at 96, and he's in India. And you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. The kids are fine right now. They're they're young. Right, but like you said before, that doesn't show up until adulthood in the so, off. Some of it, yeah. But do you know the oldest mom? Is it the sixty-five-year-old woman? I know nothing about old moms. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> I'm one. No, just kidding. <laughs> I was one. What are you talking about? You're like twenty-three, aren't you? Yeah, what? that's why I'm a young mom. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Turk. Um, I know Sarah. No. See her bubbling up her questions, so I'll just be quiet for a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you said something really interesting in that a men, men's health is connected to their sexual health, and so there's a couple of things that, that I think about in that, and it's, it's Men's Health Month, and, and one thing is the awareness that fertility issues a lot of times come from something. So like you said, the testicle is a, is a machine, and it should be operating at full speed, and, and if it's not, something's getting in the way of it. And and um, so one that recommend out and and but oh, we're losing you. Sarah. Your recommendation. You're playing the piano. Yeah, you're coming in and out. You got to say it again, love. Oh, sorry. Um, I was saying that you had mentioned that men's reproductive health is tied to their overall health. 
And if there's something going on with a man's fertility, there's probably something going on under the hood. What are your recommendations about getting treated, getting seen, getting evaluated? If you have a fertility issue, um, what should be your next steps as a man to, to take care of yourself? Well, I'm going to get on my, my, my stepping stool now, my... my, my uh... Soapbox? Yeah, the soapbox in Hyde Park. Get on it. Let's see that. So, I mean, uh, it's 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 not fair that when couples are infertile, the woman gets evaluated and treated, and the man gets a semen analysis. That's not really what he needs. He needs more than that. There are more important things. So we don't do that well in America. We don't evaluate men. They don't have to see me. They have to see someone who knows how to do a proper history and physical examination and a good screen for risk and then the semen analysis is also kind of important and just remember there's no correlation between fertility and a semen analysis unless it's zero right so you can conceive with almost anything so that's just a poor man's evaluation of a poor man I mean of a man who's infertile that's not the way we should be doing it so every man deserves an evaluation is my statement so that, we're tweeting that we're tweet we're gonna tweet that every man, <laughs> every man Men are underserved, and every man deserves care. There. And who should so, he go to? So a urologist, typically. You know, I mean, something more than a semen analysis. So, on um, if they have a semen analysis and they get referred, which is a nice idea, because the semen analysis could be normal, and they could still have a problem. It's less likely, but they could still have a problem, and because it could be a fragmentation rate or something like that. And it's more subtle. So, um, you know, I think that if that they should get a good history and physical, and you can fi you'll find things in those men. And I believe that you know the semen analysis is a reasonable biomarker of their health. It's not perfect, but the word biomarker has become a very hot term. And I think that, you know, the point where the NIH, our government, is having a bunch of us meet in a couple of months to have a think tank session to talk about what are the biomarkers that we could use for young men that might be fertility related or not that might predict their future health. So, so we did some studies looking at semen analysis in relationship to cancer development later in life and found that it was higher. So... I think that's that's important stuff. So I think that's the way the field is trending, and I'm hoping to change the culture of America. This is an American thing, right? Which men actually get real care when they're infertile, as opposed to just a semen analysis. I couldn't be more behind you. I I I, I live for this. I I I have four brothers, and I feel like young men really they do need care. They do need to understand their bodies. Uh, they do need to understand the relationship between their sexual health and their overall health. Um, and they do need a, a space to uh, um, talk about it. I think that's the other thing is, is men get really closed up about talking about this stuff because they feel like it's inappropriate or um, you know you just taught for them to speak about it. So one other issue is that our men are asking me now, should I freeze my sperm? I'm in my 30s. I'm not planning to have a kid. I'd like to have kids, but there's nothing in the future for me. And, you know, there's a lot of egg banking going on, and it's now considered, you know, routine practice, not experimental, and by the ASRM, our national society. So it's becoming quite popular, and they're egg freezing parties and um, you know, so and those are very educational. I think that's important. I mean, I, I'm going to get involved as with the same thing with men, but I don't want to scare them. But I think that, you know that's a part of awareness. And Dan Crane did a nice article for the New York Times that I talked to him about, uh, where he just said, "Should I freeze my sperm?" And we went through this. And so if you go online and look at Dan Crane, yeah, I saw that nice, nice paper, nice article about what, what should you worry about and why should you do it and who's doing it and should he be concerned? And I get this question quite a bit right now, and it's you know it's not a simple answer because it's sort of like an insurance policy, and you may or may not need it. Well, uh, thank you because that's why we're having this whole week conversation about these very uh, important, you know, kind of whispered topics 
you know, within, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the emails that I get are, or should I, what I, could I, but shush, you know, quietly, come here, let me whisper it to you. So, you know, why wouldn't a man freeze his sperm? I mean, it, it, it is an option now, right? And if all the information that you gave at the beginning, what would you think would, would discourage men from doing this? Cost? Um, well, cost? yeah, it's a bank account that they have to manage. It costs money. Right, right. cost, yeah. Most men would rather have would rather do this than get a blood draw so it's, or go to a dentist, so it's not hard to do. It's just, you know, it's quite legal. I mean, they, it's not property that gets handed down next of kin. It's not a bank account like money. They have to put in a will what they want to do with it if they can't decide. It doesn't go to anybody. It's life. So it's a very different bank account than normal. And, it, you know, and they, it's expensive. I mean, it might be $500 a year, and someone has rather get tires for their car. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, as as the cost is something to look at because Absolutely. Uh, um, a nonprofit called Banking on the Future. I know. I love that. I'm yeah. glad you brought it up. That is because we weren't seeing kids with cancer bank their sperm because of price. Right. So we That's... removed the barrier of price, and you know, it's it, we we need more donations. Um, you know, so so this is the lowest hanging fruit there is, and even in that situation where clearly you're going to have a problem, um, and it's not necessarily you're protecting your age, but you clearly have a problem, and. It's uh, you know it's quite a need, and that just people aren't doing it because cost any cost is a cost. Yeah, that's such a noble a noble thing that you're that you're uh, doing there. Uh, we talked to um, Remagine it who had uh, experienced testicular cancer, and and it devastated his fertility. And it's a real thing, and it's a real pain um, to those men who get that double blow of. Wow, I have cancer, and then wow, I can't become a father. And um, so, so I just really. I don't know what to tell the man who asks. I'd say if you're not planning to have kids soon and you want kids, then you're certainly a candidate for doing this because you don't know how long it's going to take. And it's not as dramatic as a woman freezing eggs because right. she won't have them in five years. There's just right. no opportunity. He'll have sperm in five years, and the risk isn't still that much higher in five years. So, but if he's looking at 25 years, right. you know, big deal. But who knows about 25 years? Most men make decisions in two-year intervals. That's interesting. <laughs> right so, doctor, I had one other question about um, paternal age, and we haven't touched on this, but you, you, we kind of mentioned a little bit that there's a relationship between sexual health and I'm wondering, you know, a lot of men experience as they get older. You mentioned that there's, you know, erectile dysfunction and and um, low T. There's other things that start to happen to a man as he ages. These symptoms that he gets um, are those indicators of potential fertility problems. What's the correlation there? Has there been any research? Well, there's a lot of research on what happens to older men. As they, or as men age with erections and testosterone, no one's really looked at how it all links together with fertility. But it's probably that w those wrenches that come in that affect their fertility. So clearly, if a man can't get an erection, he's going to have a fertility problem. And maybe if his testosterone's low, he'll have a fertility problem. Um, but so, so it's not. So the the whole thing isn't really sorted out yet. We just see them as confounders for fertility the things that happen as men age. Right. And of course, if you fix the erection, which is usually possible with great pills, um, if you uh, fix the testosterone, which is usually possible, and, and that could cause infertility in and of itself, but if you do it more bioidentically with uh, with with uh, CIRMs or non-FDA approved medications like CIRMs or HCG, you can. It's not necessarily true that you're going to restore the fertility because, or completely. You can restore the mechanical reasons for it, and you can get maybe the count up, but that may not change the ultimate outcome. We don't know those answers. So I guess the takeaway might be that you know, if you're if you're aging and you're experiencing some of these symptoms, it's important to bring that up with your urologist. That if you're thinking about having kids, 
there are way, there are things that you can think about, but it's not you, you, it's a puzzle, and you're going to have to try to put it together. Well, I, I I would say if you're having an erection problem as you get older, then you're at risk for heart disease. So that's a totally separate issue. And you know, so when men come in in their forties with a significant erection issue, and maybe they're trying to conceive, usually it's just situational. But my job as a doctor is to make sure his heart's okay, and that's that's the kind of foundation for our fertility work looking at biomarkers of fertility and health because we know that poor erections lead to higher rates of heart, heart attacks and strokes than men with good erections because it's all one happy family system and uh, it's just an early marker. It's a, it's a biomarker basically. So I would get more specific with erections and say if that's low then that's a concern of a whole different kind not to your fertility but to your health and if your testosterone is low, no, I think the best data out there shows that you're not going to live as long as a man with normal testosterone, and you're not going to die of anything particular like, you know, like a stroke or, or a, a cancer. But you're just going to wear out faster, and that's a VA study, and I think that's the strongest data that you should, you know, have a healthy testosterone level. Well, that's really that's just a great, you know. Great insight, and and I think another it's another men's health moment that you know erections and heart disease are connected. That's important. That's real, and and your job as a doctor is not only to help make make men into dads, but keep those dads with us, the men in our lives that we love so much. Keep them around for the long term. Yeah, and I mean, I, I have a blog on this. It's, I think it was when I was president of the Society of Male Reproduction and Urology. I wrote a blog about my vision, and my vision is to use social media to educate men about themselves. And the door that we have to men, the earliest door that you have to men, is their sexual health. The earliest way into their health is sexual health because they won't complain about anything except if they can't get an erection or if they can't have a kid, they're going to be there. You know, hopefully they'll be there. And that's the opportunity. The, the door, the, we have our foot in the door as urologists because of these issues. Right. And it still happens that these issues relate to health because everyone thought that they were something else or in his mind. And now we know that they're actually part of his health. So that was a Google lecture I gave about four or five years ago at the Metroplex talking about how sexual health is not a planet orbiting the sun, it is part of the sun, it is part of the problem, part of it's deep embedded in it and we should not think of it as something that's entirely separate but orbiting. You know, Dr. Thank you. you talk about the, the person, the whole system, you know, that's that right. so resonates with me because it is, you are a whole system, you're not just your 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 mechanical <laughs> parts that is going to create a child. You know, it's it's every part of you: your mind, your body, and your brain, and all those uh, the parts that make up you here need to be uh, thoughtfully looked at and and cared for. Yeah, so and people, you know, women have miss a miss a, a woman misses two periods. She calls her doctor. There's no situation where a man would miss something and call his doctor unless his life was threatened or he is in pain. We need a bio, we need a period for men. Right. We, Another one of the other doctors said they only seek help if they're bleeding. <laughs> you know, life is threatened. Right. Yeah, or sh or shot. Yeah, I think it was bleeding or shot. Yeah. <laughs> which is which is sad. So it, it really for me it triggers for, um, and I don't want to bring it back to women, but it really triggers of how you raise your son, how you raise your son that it's okay to be mindful about your body and start having a system of checking on yourself. You right. know, and, and the analogy I used to my 16-year-old son, and I said this before, he's probably going to kill me at the end of this week, but, you know, I just went for my mammogram. And I, it, you know, in a conversation with him, I said, you know, you know, women are taught to have, you know, self-check. You know, men should be checking their parts, and and he's like, oh my god! But it, it's a conversation, you know, of this generation to bring that mindfulness, and and it's it's part of who, what you should do. Just like checking your car's oil, you gotta check yourself, <laughs> you know. So that and and we're not being helped. I mean, the government, the National Preventative Task Force Service, a couple of years ago announced, based on, you know public screening and cost for this and that, 
that that testicular self-examination is not to be encouraged. But that, and I thought, well, that, I don't I mean it's it's the age group that has the cancer. It's the most common cancer of the age group, and they're not supposed to examine themselves. Maybe because it leads to too many ultrasounds by doctors. But honestly, the last two cancers that came through this office were men who examined themselves and noticed the change and came to me. So. Well, we're going to tweet on that one too, Dr. Turek, because so, that. You know, I'm going against the government, but uh, I don't think there's a new problem out there. That's why we love you, because you're a rebel. You're going against the government. <laughs> Man, um, self exam. What's so bad about that? Call me a disruptor in a button down shirt. <laughs> Those are the best kind. <laughs> well, Dr. Turk, we've taken so much of your time, and this was just um, so informative and wonderful, like like you are with your insights. And um, I, we're, Sarah and I are so grateful that you agreed to do this. And um, I just want to make it clear that all that information that you talked about, the banking for fu for your future, that was on the website. I'm going to ensure that that's up and stays up and goes out with all the information, the follow-up information for the summit. Because after hearing, you know, that heart-wrenching story of that, you know, uh, reimagine it, there needs to be education and a source for men when when they are faced with cancer. And, and preserving their, their fertility. So thank you so much, and uh, um, you'll, you'll be the word. Spread the word. Spread the word. Good word. Good word. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Sarah, thank you for being here thank today. You, Sarah, thank you, Carson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Turek. Good. Good program. Okay, God bless you. Bye-bye.